is not information in the mind, but it's a process of transformation in the human body. And therefore, we need to rethink the way we do formation, the way we do religious education, the way we do parishes, the way we do everything to emphasize and to create those kind of practical ways that we move out of communicating just information and move into helping children and, and, and all of us begin to experience the tra process of transformation within our bodies in our own lives. Mm -hmm. And until that happens, the church becomes more and more irrelevant. And yet people know in their hearts, we know we need this, we need this faith, we need to pass on to our children some sense of values, something. But it just isn't working. What happens is when, when we get split from our body this way and we get so into mistaking information for process that we become violent in our pain. And that's what's characteristic of our culture. We mistake, and I find this the most difficult thing in working with adults, that they don't really know the difference between an idea and a feeling. Mm -hmm. One about we are so, so uh, over-educated from the chin on up that we don't know, we don't have a feel for the difference. You only have a feel for ideas. You don't have a feel for the other. It's all new territory. Tick, there's one basic psychological ingredient that must be present in any spirituality that is healthy. Any spirituality that is healthy both for personal growth, personal growth for an individual, and also socially healthy. In other words, it's community building. Community building inside me, community building in my relationships with the world around me. And it's this, it must be an ongoing connecting or reconnecting. It must have as that basic psychological ingredient an ongoing connecting or reconnecting in the body. There must be, that's the main thing. The body is the bridge into the body of grace into the body of the revelation, into the body of Christ. Our body, the body of those people in those pews, the body of those sisters in that community, the body of those kids in that uh, uh, religion class and so forth. And instead they're getting more information about something. Not that that isn't valid in its own place, but that's not the real issue of spirituality. It must be an ongoing, the emphasis must be helping these kids connect with the body and therefore the bigger body. So the goal in that would be growing in a sense for this interconnection of all things because unless all of us can connect with our own bodies and the larger body, we spawn that kind of violence that we are all experiencing in this country now. That comes out of that disconnection. What comes is that sense from that of the interconnectedness of all things. That, that around them, people and all the things that are around us, like I said the other day, are all connected to us. So that to destroy the trees, to destroy animals, to destroy other people, is to destroy something that's a part of me. Till that comes, there's no, there's no peace, there's no, no diminishment of violence. So that's an intrinsic part of it. And this connection must be, when we teach it to children, when we do it ourselves, when we pass it on to others, it must be taught always as a non-violent, non-manipulative, non-controlling, connecting way of connecting. But there's so much in our own Judeo-Christian tradition that in, even from the point of view of pure information is moving us in the direction of what this process is all about. Because incarnation is really the stepping down into and owning what is in my body. And the whole life of grace, this life of grace that is beyond control, it's beyond the realm of control, and it comes always as pure gift, 
this life of grace is constantly available in our bodies. And the way it's described in the scriptures, there's a very special word in the scriptures that's used only six times. And that word is the pleroma. And that's translated as the fullness of the one who fills all in all. This was the great phrase that just captivated the mind of Teilhard de Chardin. And, but anyway, this pleroma is called in Greek the musterion, in Latin the mysterium, the mystery. And more often than not, that word is translated into Latin as sacramentum. So the whole sense, the body sense of sacrament, sacramentum, is that there is an invisible world, that there is more to what we see than what we see, that there is this rich, wonderful world that is beyond the realm of control, but it is available for those who have the eyes to see and the ears to hear, you see. And, but we need to be led in a body way into that updraft, into that current of gift. It needs to be emphasized that it may be invisible to one level of perception, right. but it is always felt in the body. Now, it may be invisible to our eyes and maybe even to the hawk's eyes, that column of air, but it's not, not absent from the ability of that little hawk or of us to feel it. And that's the difference. It's, in, it's maybe invisible optically or something like that, if that's the right way, but it's not beyond our capacity to know it with our bodies. And that's what's so important with what Genlin's work has done because the felt sense is precisely that. We know that we can feel that it exists, but we can't cognitively grasp it. We may know the felt sense, but we don't know what, what it is we're feeling, but we can feel it. And that's that whole realm of grace. It's there. It's basically available to us, but we have to approach spirituality so differently. Your eyes look to them deeply, and you will see how deep is the love you are if you can know every moment the truth of your person. So noble and free Your fears will fade And be transformed Into dance and song and love You can't withhold from sharing Go on Straight to your meadow Wait for the moon And wild geese who call to you If you but hear An echo within you Know you are meant to be just where Will fade and be 
transformed into dance and song and love you can't withhold from sharing. might be able to pick up from what we've said up to this point. But we're at a kind of crossroads or we're at an evolution in our own consciousness and that we're trying to bring back into balance and now I'm speaking of the human family, to not just us in this week and our work. But I think it's a massive evolution in consciousness that's taking place all over. That people realize that the old models and the one model of, of the, what I call the dominative model or the controlling model, whether you want to tack men onto it or not, or call it patriarchal, or whether it's simply the model, the only model we know, because women have gone ahead and created organizations in the same model. It's all through our institutional structure, so we don't know how else to do things and organize things without a boss. And uh, that, as I tried to say this morning, has its place uh, in certain area in a certain area of our life. But what has happened, it's overwhelmed us, and now we realize that we have begun to view all our relationships, including our relationships to our, our relationship to ourselves, in that light, in the, on that, in that model. And so what we are moving into is trying to study how we can both balance out that, that model of needing to bring a certain amount of manipulation and control into something that's proper, where it has a proper realm, and also begin to realize that how we need to go inside and learn how to companion. And that's what this is all about, focusing, is learning how to companion ourselves in then that passing that knowledge on by being a companion for other people. And I think ultimately to companion our planet, to companion our Earth, and that's what the whole environmental movement is about. When you can be able to get inside and feel the connection rather than stand outside it and analyze the connection, the way you treat yourself, other people, and the world around you is very, very different. Why? Because you then, with that connection, you sense the grace factor, if you want to put it that way, the reality of a higher power, the gift dimension of life, and the interconnectedness of all things. Analyzing it from the outside, you don't sense that. You don't feel those values, and it's only that perception and that values, that value that keeps us from uh, destroying ourselves and the world around us. And spirituality, that's, that's at the heart of what spirituality is about. Spirituality is, is, is about that companioning process, that connecting and that, uh, that sensing of the gift dimension in order that my life can go forward another step. And for my lives to go forward and for change to be possible, maybe that's another way to put it. Spirituality is about change. It's about change being the possibility of tomorrow being different than today. And we can talk about changing two different ways. We can talk about changing by manipulation and by control and by our wits and by analysis and by technology. And we can talk about change as a gift. And spirituality, obviously, is about change that is gifted to us. And it's that whole dimension now that even science is beginning to recognize somehow has to be brought in. Medicine, in particular, is beginning to recognize this. And you see the books coming out about, written by medical doctors, about including prayer and including the, these dimensions. So even from science, it's remarkable how we're beginning to recognize that 
the scientific method is not the whole picture, is not the answer. It's like the issue of wholeness is not something that we can come to through manipulation and control. And, and that's what we're, we're working with, is the issue of wholeness. And, and this, this is something that we come to in a different way to perceive the whole. We cannot analyze it into parts. You see, when, well, when we use our minds, this wonderful gift that we have of intelligence, the mind analyzes and breaks it into parts in order to know it. Whereas to perceive and know the whole, we, we know in a different way. And that's this going into our body. As, as Marshall McLuhan so eloquently wrote at one point, we must re-enter the tribal night, but this time with our eyes open. It's, it's like we're invited into the mystery of wholeness, and that's what's happening in, in, in the focusing process. You're being drawn into the movement of the story, the unfolding of wholeness. And if you look at all of the elements of the play Roma, it includes an unfolding, the unfolding of wholeness. And this was the heart of Teilhard de Chardin's approach and understanding of Christogenesis. He never spoke of the Christ, he always spoke of Christogenesis, of the unfolding of Christ. I tried to put it this way one time and work him working on a new book, and I put it this way, God gives us brain knowing to fix things. God gives us body knowing to live in the truth of ourselves and to feel the hope and the freedom of who we really are. See, for our spirit to be, God gives us body knowing in order that we may connect with and discover who we are, that our own spirit may be born. So the key, I think, one of the most important things that we can understand today in this evolution in consciousness that I speak of and trying to find that balance again is obviously to reconnect in the body. And that kind of evolution and that kind of spirituality has to be something that people experience in ordinary kind of living. And that's why I talk so much about these children and I bring in a family and so forth, because I think that's where sacramental life and where the, the spiritual maturing takes place. It's not going to take place in some religious ed class somewhere. It's going to take place with ordinary kind of human experience at home, between uh, people at work, uh, wherever just where we spend most of our time and, and our, where our relationships are. And I was on the road giving workshops a couple of years ago, and this little girl that I quote from decided she wanted to get hold of me on the road and write me about uh, something that was happening to her because she said she knew that her mother had called me on the phone and, and was kind of concerned about her. So I want to read you the letter. I think I got it in Toronto a couple of years ago. Dear Ed, I'm writing to you because tonight I had a very powerful focusing experience. I knew Mommy had been talking to you recently and she told you what I was going through. It all started a little more than a month ago when I had been ignoring a feeling that wanted very badly to be listened to. I kept thinking of something in the future all the time so that I wouldn't have to pay attention to that feeling. Sounds like somebody's <laughs> remark or opening night here, doesn't it? <laughs> it's the reason I read this, because as adults we can identify with so much of what she goes through. And then she puts in quotes, such as, bringing my teacher's rabbit home for the weekend distracted herself from what she needed to listen to by <laughs> thinking of that again. Uh, and she said, things that I was excited about, but ignoring what I felt at the moment that needed to be listened to. Mm -hmm. It became so bad that when the day came for me to bring the rabbit home, my eye ached excruciatingly, and I even threw up. What's interesting with this child is that 
Now she knows exactly, her body tells her when something isn't being listened to her. I think it's the left eye. Always starts to hurt. And her mom had it tested and everything. And I remember at the time, the first time it started to happen, we wondered what, what that was. But now we know that's her body saying she's not listening to something inside. And of course, she knows it too. So she's got the physical symptoms all down now. And as, as a teenager, it's <laughs> remarkable. As soon as that happens, she knows. She's got to focus. Even if she's not quite sure what it is she has to listen to, she knows her body's telling her something is not being heard. She says, I just couldn't be with my scary feelings gently. After that, I started living each day as though I was weighed down. Something was always just there, keeping me from feeling good. I was so scared that my eye would start hurting again also. So I put up a block keeping me from my feelings. Every few days, Mommy would ask me if I wanted to focus, and I would say yes, and then she would lead me into focusing, but I would focus all around that issue, never on it. <laughs> Just yesterday, I noticed I couldn't keep on living this way. <laughs> I was always tired. And it seemed as though I wasn't really living. That night, before I was going to sleep, I wrote a poem in my mind. I realize now I would never have written it if I hadn't been going through what I was going through. And here's my poem. And she labels it, Where Only I Could Climb. That's the name of the poem. I started out as an infant, new to the world. I looked upon the world with fresh young eyes, with delightful ambitions ahead. I grew older, breaking away from the hands that supported me, and grew into my own. I started the great climb. I came to stumbling blocks of pain, fear, and sorrow. When I picked them up and caressed them with a loving hand, they slowly melted away and then I could journey on. I came to plateaus, looking over the horizon and the path I had just climbed. I never camped in any one place, but continued upwards, striving for the top where only I could climb. She was about 14 when she wrote that. This. 13, maybe. The next day, so that's the end of this little poem that she wrote. The next day I sat down with mommy again. I focused on an entirely different subject, but this time it led me into my fear of pain. Mommy and I talked a little while she told me what you had said to her on the phone. Places like these need a little more care. It then dawned on me I needed to relax and let go right into my fear. And that's what I did. I closed my eyes and went into my painful fears. That was when I noticed it. There wasn't anything there. I had plunged into my fears, letting go as the little voice inside me had told me to do, and all my fear of pain melted away. It was as if I dived into a pool and the water melted away, but I had a soft landing. I was so shocked at the, su at the sudden occurrence that I let out a giggle and couldn't stop laughing. I was so amazed how good it felt inside. I couldn't believe that all I had done was let go into my fear, and yet I was so afraid of letting go before. Big exclamation marks and big print letters and all this in this, this section. I can't explain to anyone how good it felt inside. I felt as though I could actually live again. I kept re repeating to myself how extremely wonderful it felt inside. I remember myself thinking of the pain I had feared before and the whole memory of the pain vanished no matter how many times I tried to think it back in to make sure this was for real. <laughs> since, mommy t since mommy told you, 
what I was going through, I wanted to let you know what has happened since. It is way past my bedtime, so I have to end this. I hope you have a very successful workshop, love Elizabeth. <laughs>